Hello everybody! So, today is the finalization of our introduction to computer science. So this is where we were laying the groundwork for the digital revolution, taking it through each of its uh, of its time frames. So we're going to do a little recap and then we'll finish up the last two sections, which are um, network uh, computing and cloud computing. And then also a little bit of, we'll discuss a little bit of the current state of things. So, let's pull up the notes here. Digital, so we've already covered digital in the context of computation. We know that it's the storage of information as a sequence belonging to a set of discrete values. Uh, let's see the example, uh, see one such method would be the binary system, correct? Then we talked about the digital revolution where our society is changing uh, with the increased use of, of computers and it's touching all aspects of society. We then talked about data processing, and this was the first stage or the first phase of the digital revolution. This was where we were um, using, what was it? We were using uh, centralized computing, correct? So we had a main, a mainframe computer was another term for it. And then you accessed that computer via terminals, very business and research oriented. We then got, we then discussed the era of personal computing, and this is where we begin to see that um, uh, consumers are starting to use computers, but not as readily as you would think because the software was not at the level, I should say the, the, the software was not sophisticated enough at this time, or the um, it simply wasn't available. And now we get into network computing, which is the third phase of the digital revolution. So first of all, what is a network in the context of computers? It's a decentralized linking of computational devices that share data and the results of individual computations to achieve either a collective result or individual communications. So that's a pretty wordy definition, but uh, let's, let's break this down. So decentralized linking. This means that we are not at the state of the uh, centralized computations where there was one main computer that performed all the computations and then everyone simply uh, either input data or, or, or retrieved data from that computer. This is uh, multiple computers working across a network that perform their own computations, that perform their own calculations, and then they will share those calculations with the user who may in turn share them uh, with other computers. So this is a computer network. It's marked by, or so a computer network, one of its characteristics is that it, uh, it involves running software on local machines and then sharing the results with other machines. Now it's important to note that the one of the most uh, influential and important ne uh, networks that we use right now is the internet. But it uh, but computer networks existed before and do exist now apart from the internet. It was a communication feature of business and educational establishments when you needed uh you know you needed um, personnel to be updated or you needed records kept for various departments this was the uh, the method for allowing that form of communication now it's important to note I have the word here bespoke creations what do I mean by that these networks before the internet were um, highly customized very tailored to their particular application and because of that they were often very complicated and unreliable if you didn't have the right personnel to staff or, uh, or the right staff to maintain the networks very often they would and still do fall into disrepair um, and just become very difficult to use which then brings us to our next phase of computer networks and that is the use of the internet so first of all what is the internet well it is a global computer network so essentially take the definition for network which is decentralized linking of computational devices and apply that internationally so now you have a network which can span the globe over uh, a, a myriad of different methods for uh, for connecting could be via satellite, could be uh, data cables, 
uh, you name it, uh, could be wireless, could be Bluetooth. But there are many uh, ways to connect to the internet, and we'll discuss that in future videos. But suffice it to say that the internet is a global uh, version of a computer network. It was rooted in military research, and it was once again uh, the most the most prepared military is the is the best informed military. And so, yeah, if you try to use as many tools as you can at your disposal to maintain communications, to gather data, to share data, you have the advantage. So that's why you would see it coming from the military. It was then transferred to the Na uh, National Science Foundation, the NSF, for further development and refinement, where it gradually gained popularity in the private sector. And then finally, it becomes commercialized in the early 1990s, and this is when it really took off. Uh, before that time, it was primarily an educational or a hobbyist uh, um, uh, uh, I don't want to say platform, but almost that, like a, a, a hobbyist network, if you will. And it becomes commercialized in the early 1990s, which then allows businesses to do what businesses do best, and that is uh, market their goods and wares. I'm sure you've seen quite a few ads on YouTube videos. That is an example of the commercialization of the internet. So we have the internet, which is the global network. Well, what what is the material called that is shared? So the data, the content that is shared on the internet. Well, that is the web. So here's, here's the differentiation between the web and the internet. The web is the entire repository of data that can be accessed via the internet. It's short for the World Wide Web. The data that the internet operates on, shares, and adds to. So think of the internet as the dynamic aspect to the global network and the web as being more static or the results of the dynamic activity of the computers on the internet. So that is, that's the difference between them. So for instance, I am sharing this video, I'm making this video on a personal computer, okay? So that means that I am in the era of personal computations, if you will. And then once I finish my edits on my local machine and I push it up to YouTube or whatever platform, I am now interacting with the internet. But I have produced a bit of content or data that has now been added to the web. So it's been added to the web via the internet. So now let's talk about some of the markers of the, comp of the computational era uh, from 1995 to 2010. We've already seen that it's the rise of the internet. It's the uh, it's the creation, the explosion, really, of the web. So, what are some of the markers of that era? Well, we see an increased use of laptops versus tower or desk computers, um, the big clunky devices that were. Uh, I'm sure you've seen in in uh, old in old films. You still do have tower uh, units as well. But um, at this time, you see computers gradually moving more and more into the realm of mobility. The uh, second marker was that you see sophisticated but general purpose or use case uh, software bundles. So uh, at this time, you don't see very highly specialized software applications. They still existed, no, uh, no doubt. But the main, the main emphasis of software uh, companies was to produce bundles so your your uh, text editing bundles your your time management your productivity uh, um, softwares all of that they were very very large very large packages and the reason for that of course is that with this explosion of of new users you uh, companies software companies were attempting to meet the needs of many customers with one package you really didn't know what all your customers would need so you simply bundle this software together and your your average user may not use all of the features but you will provide a feature for at least one customer and a satisfied customer is usually a returning customer. The, uh, the third feature or marker of the computational era was tethered 
internet connections. So this was via, um, via I don't think it was Ethernet at that time, uh, might have been, uh, let me know in the comments if it was, but it was definitely tethered connections. So you were connected to the internet via a line, similar to uh, the old telephone jacks or coaxial TV cables. Now, the uh, at this time, you also see, so not only did you have these, so we've covered increased use of the laptops, so further mobility, sophisticated but general purpose or use case software bundles, tethered internet connections, and a marked rise in and establishment of online social activities. And this, uh, these came in multiple forms. The first was what are what's known as asynchronous communications, a meaning uh, non or, or not. So not synchronous communications. This is uh, uh, essentially the old um, letter, you know, snail mail or passing someone a note, leaving someone a note on the office. So this is where you uh, um, uh, uh, communicate with someone, but they don't have to physically be there. So the online version or the internet version of asynchronous communications included, they weren't limited to, but they included email, forms, and chat rooms. So you could engage with people in a, a non a, a non physical sense. The uh, second form of communication at this time was synchronous communication. This would be voice and video conferencing. So this was the rise of Skype, this um, and video chat. Um, so this is it. It's also rising at, at this time, not quite to the level that it is now here in 2023. I would say that video conferencing is probably one of the most uh, widely used uh, forms of communication. It's a very synchronous uh, um, world, uh, online world that we live in. And then the third uh, um, facet of, uh, of increased online social activities was online multiplayer gaming. This was a huge boom in, in the online multiplayer world. Uh, and this would include either asynchronous or synchronous chats. So you'd have the, you know, the chat box, or you could actually be uh, in, you know, in what were essentially uh, voice calls with your fellow players, um, and you were able to maintain communications. So this is another form of social activity. And then the last one was music sharing. Music sharing, you know, just exploded at this time, uh, as we saw in the previous slide where we talked about digital. We saw that digital content is very easily reproduced, and because of that, you have music, which before, as we spoke of, you had have a vinyl recording, or you'd have to go and actually listen to someone perform or hear it on the radio. Now you could simply share it as a digital file very easily. So that sharing and acquisition of music really just took off during this era. And now we move into our next phase of of computational or I should say the digital revolution. And this is the stage that we're currently in and that is the stage of cloud computing. So what is cloud computing? It's the storage and use of web-based data and software in an interconnected system of computers and communication devices such that individual users interact with multiple computers at any given time and do not rely solely on the abilities of individual computers. So I'm going to say that again. So it's the storage and use of web-based data and software in an interconnected system of computers and communication devices, such that individual users interact with multiple computers at any given time and do not rely solely on the abilities of individual computers. The second point, only a display device with minimal graphics capabilities are necessary to access the computational powers of the cloud. So what do I mean by this? In cloud computing, the all of your necessary content or uh, your desired content uh, doesn't have to be stored on a on a local machine, as we saw with um, personal computing, and then also e even network computing. 
in this in this methodology, it is a crossover between uh, network computing and centralized computing in that you essentially, as the user, are working with what amounts to a terminal input and output, and the computations are being performed on other machines, on, on uh, um, machines that you may not even be aware of. It could be a server farm, it could be, who knows what, another computer, if you know, if you're connected in some sort of uh, um, cloud, cloud computing service. So you may, you may never actually require the computational abilities of your own computer. You're doing all of the computations on other people's computers. The difference between cloud computing and uh, centralized computing is that on a central uh, on centralized computing, you know that it is you know that it is a single machine. You knew that it was the mainframe, and you were connected to the terminal. With cloud computing, you don't know exactly where the computation is occurring. You can have a guess. You probably would be able to trace it. You could uh, you could put a tracer on the data as it pings between different computers, but uh, they're uh, very different, very different uh, um, beasts, so to speak. So, what does cloud computing lead to? Cloud computing leads to what is called convergence. This is the ability of a single computational device to function in multiple capacities. It's the electronic equivalent of a multi-tool. What was it? Uh, uh, Doctor Who's, uh, um, what's it called? A, like a cosmic screwdriver or something like that? Let me know in the comments below. So essentially, that is the, the device that is rendered by convergence is a device that can function in the areas of location and navigation, time management, communication, education, entertainment, data recording and sharing all on the same device. And because we are connected, uh, you know, the idea of convergence, it requires the use of the cloud because all of the hard number crunching and the data storage happens apart from the actual device itself. Essentially what happens is the device becomes an input and output device and the processing is happening in a wireless fashion. I do also want to say that at this time, uh, in, in the era of cloud computing, which we are living in right now, we use uh, uh, I wouldn't say predominantly, I don't know the exact numbers on this, but we see a very high number of wireless devices. In fact, how many cell phones are there in the world? Those cell phones, uh, if they're smartphones, they are wireless computers connected to the cloud, connected to the internet, and using cloud services, email, video sharing, uh, video creation even in some in some ways uh, video conferencing you saw the rise of zoom during uh during the covid era and that is an example of cloud computation where if you were accessing it via the browser well that that uh, uh video conferencing was being done apart from your own computer your computer was sharing some of it but uh not the full load so uh, pretty incredible so, as I said, this uh, that's the era that we're living in right now. And now we're going to move forward and try and take a look at the future a little bit, and this will set the pace for our deep dive going forward on uh, on the actual, the, the, the basics of computers. What, what do they do? How do they operate? But what is the current state of computation? Well, we are currently living in Web 2.0. You hear some people talking about, you know, moving even further along, which with the, well, uh, I think they, I've heard some people call it transcendence, right? Where uh, you actually become connected uh, directly to the internet. We still have that divide, some would say for the better. But um, what what is Web 2.0? It's the shifting of the balance of web data away from commercially generated content towards user generated content. So it's shifting from commercial content to user generated content.
In fact, you see it even here on, uh, on the YouTube platform. What percentage of YouTube content is created by users versus corporations, um, corporate entities, uh, government, um, government PR, PR systems. So it's a, it's a, it's an interesting it's an interesting thing to think about is that in this world the grassroots as eventually takes over they begin to produce the content they begin sharing the content they're consuming but they're also producing at the same rate and that really uh, changes changes the dynamic of the web itself so how is this information being shared on the web it's being shared uh, it's created for and spread through social media networks so video sharing this is your youtube tiktok rumble um the video um i, I believe even services such as um twitter facebook uh what else Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, all of those, they have video sharing, but you know, you have specialized video sharing platforms as well. You then have image sharing, and this would be your Instagrams. Uh, my mind's drawing a blank right now. I thought of the gram first, but there are so many others. Um, and image sharing, this is not just, this is not just photographs that people have made, but that's also art. So that's your image. So it's image sharing and generation. We see that also with the rise in, in uh, AI art that that's being created on the web for the web in a in an AI fashion. It's crazy. And then of course you have your textual uh, your textual data as well. So this would be still you know your your generic uh, blog posts, um, still writing articles for the web, uh, um, books that are published entirely online. They never even have a printed copy. Um, your uh, Twitter th uh, threads, your Facebook chats, your Facebook message boards. I mean, that's so many. It, it, it's almost like I could probably sit here and read off all of the different forms of social network and you would you would be asleep and I still wouldn't be done. Uh, and then this next uh, aspect is auditory. So this is auditory information. And this is this is a kind of a surprising aspect in that you would think that with being such visual creatures that uh, video would take over completely and for the most part it has it's a it's a it's a wide part of of information excuse me I just sneeze there for a second um, so you see with the rise in auditory in, in information this is your podcasts um, your audiobooks, um, what else? Music, obviously. So that still is a very large portion of the information that is being created and spread um, uh, by Web 2.0. And then finally, this this last aspect is essentially the combination of video and auditory. But the VR experience, I did want to uh, bring it out because we see an increased use of this VR experience, which I would almost put in its own category because it's a very immersive experience and it almost becomes a, at least from a, from a, the, the uh, user's perspective, a very, a, a much more involved, a much more involved experience. Uh, video sharing is, and, and the reception or the the watching of video data is um, a little bit more of a passive experience as is image textual and auditory unless you're actually speaking of course if you're sharing if you're communicating you're having to do some work but vr is interesting in that you can be you can be a participant in this world and it doesn't have quite the passive quality that the other forms of content do so just wanted to include that in the list so what is the what is a marker of web 2.0 well it's characterized in the extreme so i i don't want to i don't want to 
overgeneralize here, but it's characterized by hyperactive communication of information. So this is where you see the allows, so the web 2.0 allows for the for constant creation and spread of what is known as viral content. And that is because it is such a grassroots movement. People find what they like, they, they stick with that, they share it, they add to it, and you get very passionate uh, groups of of individuals creating and sharing this information and it can spread like wild uh, fire so you can have someone create a video in oh i don't know namibia and it's you know people find it funny and they begin to share it and it just takes off millions of people can see content that was created just a few minutes ago so that's not that wouldn't be really possible with uh, more corporate um content creation because it has to go through a vetting process where uh, it's it's decided if it's in the company's best interest to put information like that out there versus when you've got you know you have people who have no idea of of um corporate interest of centralized interest they're only thinking of what is interesting to them it's a very personalized experience and so therefore they can watch something enjoy it share it and other people of the same uh, mentality do the same thing. So Web 2.0, it lacks centralized control, and this increases the likelihood of mob mentality and groupthink, but also allows for the flowering of individual freedom, uh, bringing wrongdoing to light, uh, fail to write the rest of that, bring wrongdoing to light, really shed, you know, shed a uh, light on some really dark aspects of um, human activities. Um, and the web has has helped in that. It, it has helped to uh, to bring things to light, and that's good. And a more robust discussion of ideas. So when you have this grassroots information sharing and spread, you don't have an authoritarian aspect where um, there's there's a crackdown on ideas that are considered uh, harmful to a particular worldview. It, when you have this constant clash of worldviews happening online, um, there each one is vying with the other. It becomes very factionalized, if you will. So we see, but there is a downside to that, and that is that when you, as we said earlier, with uh, passionate people, you now have the increased chance of mob mentality. So this is where people get on the bandwagon and when a dissenter speaks up, you have many people now who will shout down the dissenter uh, uh, because they engage in the in the luxury, if you will, or the security that being part of a pack brings. So you actually, um, I, I was watching uh, a video on the I forget the channel name. I'll, I'll have to look for it later. But um, talking about the problem of anonymity. And you see, anonymity can be a good thing. If you have to shed light on on a, on a bad situation, if you, have, if you have to be a whistleblower, you do want to be anonymous for your own personal safety. However, in the general case, anonymity is not does not produce better people because you can hide in the shadows and you strike out from the shadows. And that ability to strike out from the shadows actually makes people more aggressive and brings out more negative qualities. So just something to bear in mind. Uh, and then our next point is that the sheer mass of disclosed information can pose a security risk. When you're sharing as much information as we do in Web 2.0, it's unbelievable to to think uh, if you go back just a hundred years ago or 200 years ago and you put yourself in that time think about what you would and wouldn't share to your nearest neighbors would you be telling them would you be um, riding over on your horse and buggy and telling them what you just had for lunch and oh my gosh it was the best thing Sorry if I'm doing an impersonation. I'm not trying to be mean here, but just imagine that. Imagine, uh, yeah, it, it's it's really something something th uh, to think about that how quickly we have shifted, where we can share anything and 
everything. And we don't even realize half the time what we're sharing, the amount of data that can be gleaned from the content that we create. So this presents a radical redefinition of private versus public. And it can pose a, a security risk, or we may simply redefine what we consider as private versus public. People in the past would have considered a lot of what we share as very private. You don't share that. You don't let anyone know about that. Uh, but in this world, no matter. You have people suffering from mental mental illness, and they're loud and proud about it. They 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 let people know. They let uh, they let people know that they're struggling, and they keep people updated on it. And you know, is that a problem? I don't know, but it's happening. It's the world we live in. Uh, and that's something that we'll definitely have to consider going forward. The Web 2.0 also is morphing interpersonal communications. So what do I mean by that? It means that individuals can present an increased sense of self or greater expression of individuality than was previously realized in conventional interactions, IRL, in real life. This means that you can be more effusive, more uh, passionate uh, in the online world because you have that certain level of separation. You're not you're not face to face with someone who you disagree with and you're not shouting at them. You, you, know, you get the funny meme about that little uh, guy like 14 or a 15 year old and he's shouting curse words at a at a guy who's probably about a foot taller than him and the caption is uh, um, Jimmy, didn't realize that this is not how you communicate IRL. And it's just, it's a funny uh, way to think that you can, you can shout, shout expletives at people online. You can engage in flame wars and walk away. You're not going to be punched in the face, but you try and do that in real life. Oh boy, you're going to suffer the repercussions as we've seen many times. So that's, we see that it's, it's, it's changing the way that we communicate these days. Now, moving on from Web 2.0, we're now going to talk about what, what is the culmination of the digital revolution and what it's known as the Internet of Things and ultimately uh, transcendence itself. So what is the Internet, the Internet of Things? It's the transformation of all electronically controlled devices into data transmitters and receivers that maintain a constant flow of information to and from the web. What does this mean? This means that any device that has electronic controls has the ability to share its state and the state of the environment that it's in with the web. So let's say, for instance, that... What's a good... Uh, What's a good analogy? Let's say, for instance, that I uh, that I have in my fridge, I have an item counter, and I take something out of the fridge. It, the uh, and there's chip in the item itself. I take it out. I use it. I throw it away. The fridge keeps track of those items. You take something out. It note it notes that something has been taken out. It then aler alerts your phone or whatever device we're using at that time that this item has been taken out. Your phone is tracking your location. It knows that you are at the store. It has received a notice from the uh, from the um, fridge via the internet or via the web, and it lets you know that you need to buy something. Or what's another one? You could have. You could have electronic, in fact, this is the case, you can have electronic health health monitors. They monitor, let's say that, uh, let's say that they could monitor your, your hydration level. Let's say if that was a thing. So it was monitoring your hydration level or it was monitoring the last time you had a drink of water or something like that. And it lets you know, hey, you need to drink something. That's, that is where we're headed with the internet of things, the constant flow of information where everything about your environment is monitored by electronic devices and you are informed by those devices of how you should operate in the world. What is the result of a full embrace of the Internet of Things? 
It's the complete expression of humanity's control over its environment, a maintenance of physical, biochemical homeostasis through electromechanical intervention. We see, we uh, first begin our discussion of the digital revolution, seeing that it was merely the next phase of man's, of man's desire or humanity's desire to control the world in which we live, to make it more comfortable for us to maintain what we consider to be normal. And we see now that uh, the Internet of Things and finally transcendence itself is how, do, how best do we maintain what we consider to be normal. And that's, that's a hairy situation, isn't it? Because what may be considered normal for some people is not considered normal by others. So there's gonna, and there will have to be constant dialogues, constant discussions to determine what is normal, what is, as, as uh, it says in the scripture, Pontius Pilate, what is truth? Is your truth the same as my truth? Uh, is your expression of homeostasis the same as mine? So a lot of things to discuss, um, uh, but that has been our intro to uh, our, 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 the history of the digital revolution and laying the groundwork for where we are now so thank you very much for watching uh it's it's been uh, a real joy to talk about these ideas with you i look forward to reading your responses in the comments um yeah let's let's keep the dialogue going uh and let's make sure that we don't fall into the same trap of mob mentality and just accepting what other people consider to be normal Let's, let's be part of that discussion of what normal is. So thank you very much for watching. If you uh, liked the video, um, consider subscribing to the channel or um, hit a little, the little like bar at the bottom <laughs> um, and uh, share it with your friends. So thank you very much for watching and have a wonderful day. Bye-bye.